Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of give you a background of where we've been um, in treating patients with uh, Fanconi anemia with cellular therapy to kind of give an idea of what our challenges are to make sure that gene therapy is effective therapy and also how well it needs to work to compete with traditional transplant. Um, so this is what Minnesota often looks like now, not the previous picture, but actually it's a, it, it's a lot warmer to this weekend than anticipated. Um, but, and I have no disclosures that are relevant for this talk. Um, so this is where we were with our success of bone marrow transplant in Fanconi anemia um, years ago. Um, the first two upper curves are uh, probability of survival in patients that had an HLA sibling donor and had FA, with the upper curve being those children that were less than 10 years of age when they were transplanted, and the next one being if they were over 10 years of age. And the two lower curves being for those FA patients transplanted in the 1990s um, with an unrelated donor. And these data are from the CIBMTR, and it really showed that Back then, if you had a, if you had Fanconi anemia and needed an unrelated donor transplant, the probability of success was around 25 percent. Um, and so using this as a background, at the University of Minnesota, a group of us have really been challenged to improve upon these results. Um, and the reason it's so challenging to transplant FA patients, as many of us um, who take care of them know, is first of all, we have to find a suitable donor. So many of these patients don't have a sibling donor that they themselves also don't have FA. So often we have to look for unrelated donors. Um, FA patients, as we know, don't repair their DNA well uh, because of their inherent DNA defect. And so they only can handle about a fifth of the normal dose of chemotherapy or radiation than somebody without FA, making it very challenging to achieve engraftment without terrible toxicity. The other part of that is every FA patient is different, and actually even FA patients within their own family will be very different about how they handle the preparative therapy. So designing effective preparative therapy is very challenging. Because of that, it, historically, the risk of graft failure was extraordinarily high with one in three FA patients having graft failure after a transplant. The risk of GVHD was extraordinarily high with absolutely no benefit in this subset, in, in this type of patient to have GVHD. These patients had a very high risk of opportunistic infection and indeed often came to us with infections. And because transplant was so unsuccessful, these patients often were heavily transfused and had other comorbidities when they came to transplant and were extraordinarily high risk. And this is all the, these are all the reasons why success was so low historically. So what we did was tackle each of these challenges one at a time. And this is a slide um, of Ellie and Gluckman in Paris transplanting the first patient um, in the world with, oh sorry, Oh dear, you didn't hear anything I said. <laughs> I'm transplanting the first patient successfully in the world with cord blood transplant. This boy was from uh, Florida. His sister had, um, his parents had saved his sister's cord. The FDA would not allow him to have a, that transplant in the States because we hadn't had that set up yet. So he flew to Paris. He had Fanconi anemia and Elian successfully transplanted him. And there he is 20 years later in the, in the picture uh, at the bottom right, and we actually still follow him at the University of Minnesota. He's now in his 30s and doing very well. So certainly cord blood has really um, expanded our donor pool for FA patients um, very successfully. So the, the next uh, big tackle in transplanting FA patients um, was graft failure. And this is um, an old publication that uh, we wrote up now 20 years ago, looking at FA patients and trying to determine when we looked at those with graft failure versus those that engrafted, we looked at their lymphocytes and looked at 
um, the percent of the lymphocytes that were DEB positive, in other words, they were acting like FA cells. And you can see on the left side, those patients that had graft failure, a uh, lower percentage of their lymphocytes were DEB positive compared to those that engrafted. And so what this was telling us is that some of those host lymphocytes were DEB resistant and likely were not successfully eradicated with the low dose of chemotherapy and radiation we were giving these patients um, and then contributing to graft failure. So we needed to do something to our preparative therapy to get rid of these lymphocytes. And what we did was added fludarabine to the preparative regimen. That one change um, changed the probability in graftment. So the lower graft was of 23 patients that did not receive fludarabine. All of these are FA patients. The higher graph is 107 of our FA patients that received fludarabine. So that one change to the preparative therapy completely changed the risk of graft failure from 30% to less than 2%. Our next struggle to make transplant successful for FA patients was to get rid of graft versus host disease. Um, this slide here is from the Paris group, looking at a large cohort of patients uh, with FA who underwent transplant and looking years after transplant, out to 12 years after transplant, and determining the cumulative incident, incidence of head and neck cancer. For patients that did not develop acute GVHD, none of them developed head and neck cancer. But for those with grade two to four GVHD, years later, 28% developed head and neck cancer. So really speaking to, there's some immune dysregulation at the time of acute GVHD, making them at much higher risk for uh, head and neck cancer. And this held true too for chronic GVHD. So really drove us to figure out how do we get rid of GVHD. And really we did that with T cell depletion. And we've used different modalities of T cell depletion over the years, but really have successfully gotten rid of GVHD. And that's shown here. Um, uh, the lower graft is looking at those patients, 95 FA patients who received a T cell depleted graft, and the probability of grade 2 to 4 GVHD was only 18%, compared to 50% for those that received a T repleted marrow, and then 38% for core blood patients. So essentially, all our FA patients get a T cell depleted graft. Um, similarly, the incidence of chronic graft versus host disease was very low in, that, in those patients who received T cell depleted marrow at only 9%. So our next strategy was how to make the immune system recover faster and our patients to have less um, infections. And we looked back at very old data showing that if at the time of a transplant for a mouse model, if the thymus was shielded, um, the immune recovery occurred faster. And so we challenged our radiation oncologists to learn to shield the thymus of our patients before they received radiation. And this is just showing the schemata of um, how they locate the thymus or um, even if they can't locate it, figure out where it likely is and then build shielding with the dosimetry curve on the bottom right showing that they effectively shield the thymus. And in doing so, it, it, it takes an extra couple of hours of um, planning in order to build the right shields. But in doing so, we showed that after transplant, we're seeing an increase in naive T cells. This is just one of our slides showing faster immune recovery in those patients that had a shielded thymus at the time of transplant with no negative effect of, on engraftment. So all the patients engrafted. We don't shield the thymus if our FA patients have leukemia, obviously worried that we might be um, shielding some leukemic cells that need to be eradicated with a thymus. But otherwise, we're using this modality in all of our FA patients who get radiation um, we only use radiation for unrelated donors, not the related donors anymore. Um, so this is, um, this is one of those slides that depicts 20 years of research. <laughs> but what, what this shows is what we've done with our preparative therapy over the last 20 years. Um, for alternative donors for FAs, um, FA patients. And so we initially adopted what Ellie and Gluckman from Paris was doing, 
with a single unfractionated dose of TBI of 450 and with cytoxin um, 10 per kilo for four days and then a transplant. Um, and that was back in the 1980s. Um, and again, we had the challenges of graft failure um, and graft versus host disease. So we initially added ATG to help with engraftment, used T cell depletion, and for a while increased the dose of TBI to 600, but that didn't improve the engraftment rate. And that was when we added the fludarabine in 1999 with a very good success in achieving engraftment. Um, and then we added the thymic shielding in 2003. Then we asked the question if we could indeed decrease the dose of radiation and still have effective engraftment. Um, and to do that, developed a trial to decrease it to 300, then to 150, and then hopefully to no radiation. But we had to stop at 300. 150 wasn't sufficient to achieve sustained engraftment. We gave two patients 150 um, centigrade, and they both achieved engraftment, but then developed secondary graft failure. So we've held tight at the 300. Um, and then what we did is we actually got rid of ATG in 2015 and are still able to achieve engraftment um, without it. And that really speaks to the effectiveness of the fludarabine. And here we are with our success rate with each, with each sequential trial where we've just made one change. And you can see, compared to when we started at this in 1995, with only 22% of our patients surviving um, in, the, in the highest cohort there at 73%. But indeed, it's even higher when we look at the subset of patients who come to us with no transfusions and no serious life-threatening opportunistic infections infection, our survival rate now is 94% after an alternative donor transplant. And that's compared to those that don't fit those criteria. And so this is really where we are. And you know, when we think of gene therapy, what we need to be able to achieve. Um, we have modified our um, preparative therapy since this. Um, Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say that now our results for alternative donor transplant for FA are now the same for sibling donor. Um, and so uh, the timing of when patients come to transplant doesn't differ between donor sources. Um, and um, this, this graph has continued on with our subsequent um, cohort of patients since this was published a couple of years ago. Um, our, our newest iteration uh, is to use alpha-beta um, T-cell depletion. Um, and as you know, this is a more effective way uh, to T-cell deplete the graft, so much so indeed that we're not using any immune suppression after transplant. Um, we've just been doing this for the last year or so. Uh, we do give the patients one dose of rituximab um, because of the risk of PTLD, and indeed our first patient without that dose of rituximab, rituximab did develop PTLD. But we've effectively uh, transplanted eight patients with alpha-beta T-cell depletion. Um, they're all alive and well. One did have secondary graft failure associated with an infection, but was successfully uh, transplanted. Um, no patient has developed GVHD. And it's really quite remarkable to be able to transplant these patients with no immune suppression, because they don't develop any of the um, complications from being on cyclosporin or other drugs. Um, so looking at the obstacles to transplant 20 years ago, we've um, achieved, um, we've overcome many of these obstacles uh, with our changes to our, our preparative therapy. And now it really speaks to where does gene therapy fit in uh, for these patients. Um, and the reason gene therapy um, is particularly interesting in FA patients is um, really supported by the very rare cases of um, patients with mosaicism um, who, so they have a, a, a portion of their cells that don't have FA, um, and they eventually revert back to normal hematopoiesis. So with competitive uh, repopulation with uh, those normal hematopoietic cells that aren't FA, they in sense do their own gene therapy. And um, the graph on the right shows uh, an example of this that um, was published a few years ago of a patient that over time 
um, his counts improved as his um, as, saying, as his cells showed that he was losing his FADV sensitive cells and reverted back to um, normal hematopoietic cells with no evidence of FA, and he just did that on his own. So it, it, it really supported the idea if we could promote this. We know FA cells don't proliferate well, so if we could insert some normal uh, corrected cells into a patient with FA, over time we would have correction of cells. So the advantage of um, gene therapy obviously is that ideally we can do this with no preparative therapy, not putting FA patients at risk for toxicity. Um, without giving them a transplant, then we don't work excuse me, worry about infections as much or GVHD. But there's a lot of unique challenges. FA patients tend to have very hypocellular marrows, so how do you harvest enough cells to correct them? Um, do you, when do you harvest them? Um, do you freeze them or, or um, give them fresh? Um, we all know that FA cells have an extraordinarily risk of developing clonal abnormalities. Certainly we don't want to promote any uh, clonal um, abnormalities uh, and, and to harvest those cells. Um, and truthfully, you know, to make this effective, compared to different um, uh, other diseases that we're doing gene therapy in, for FA patients, ultimately, they have to correct all their cells. We don't want any residual FA cells in these patients because of the extraordinary risk of them developing leukemia over time. So that's a huge high bar that we have to eventually achieve in these patients to make it successful. We don't want them to be um, have any residual FA cells. So uh, these next slides are courtesy of Juan um, Buren in Spain, um, who is the PI of this first trial supported by Rocket uh, Pharmaceuticals, looking at gene therapy for FA uh, patients um, who belong to FANC A. And um, what they did here is they took young children in this trial, three to six years of age, who only had moderate marrow failure, so pretty decent counts. And they used a lentiviral vector um, to, to correct the cells and give the cells back. So these children were mobilized with GCSF and plerixifor in the hospital. They were admitted and the mobilization took, over, took a week and a half to achieve. Um, the cells in this trial were cryopreserved, transduced with the lentivirus, and then reinfused into the patient with no conditioning. They, um, in total, um, treated nine patients, but these data are only from four patients who had follow-up of at least a year and a half. Um, and the left upper uh, graph there is from patient 02002 who had the highest number of gene mark corrected cells. If you look at the, um, the axis, you can see that up to 60% of his cells were corrected. And this is and a very high copies per genome as well. This is very much in contrast to all other patients treated. All other patients only had four to about 10% of their cells corrected. We've discussed this patient O2, um, the, the first patient uh, number two, extensively and cannot figure out why his, um, his correction was so much higher than other patients, but that is what the data showed. You can also see for all of these patients, over time, the percent of the marked cells increased. Uh, these data here are showing a myeloid and lympho lymphoid uh, peripheral blood cells and how, again, over time, the percent of cells increased um, uh, for the most part. Some of them stayed stable, but for the most part, they increased over time in their correction. This is looking at the gene marking in the bone marrow cell compartment. Again, over time, for the most part, we see an increase. This is anywhere from 6 to 24 months, and then the, the lower uh, one is uh, up to 12 months. Uh, this is an important slide showing that there's oliclonal correction, that we're not actually having just a single clone that is uh, correcting the cells, and that's important, especially for these FA patients. <clears throat> 
This is showing that um, the cells indeed are becoming um, MMC, MMC resistant, so non-FA over time. This is looking at um, the same thing in the peripheral blood, that over time the cells are getting corrected. And then this is looking at, um, in green, the corrected cells, and in red, the uncorrected cells of the four patients. The shaded area in gray is when the gene-corrected cells were given. So if you start on the left-hand side, you can see this is a patient that, that had the most corrected cells and his white cells were decreasing. Then in the, when the gray bars or the gray shade starts, he got the corrected cells, and then his white cells are more or less stable. The bottom graph is showing in red, his uncorrected cells, his white cells are going down, but the green corrected, gene corrected cells are going up and making, <clears throat> excuse me, more of his white cells. And similarly, for the other patients, you're seeing stabilization of their white cells with the corrected cells contributing more than the uncorrected cells to those cells. Dr. McMullen, you have two more minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, this is also showing, again, the same thing, um, but just looking at platelets, neutrophils, um, and looking at, um, sorry, the, looking at the hemoglobin, the neutrophils, the hemoglobin, the platelets of the patients and seeing over time, you know, at best there's a stabilization. There might be some increase, but at best there's a stabilization. Importantly, for all these patients in order to be mobilized successfully, they did receive red cells at the time of mobilization and many of them did receive a platelet count as well. So I think what we're seeing with gene therapy is that uh, we are seeing a progressive repopulation of stem cells after two or three years, that there is oliclonal reconstitution, so that's um, reassuring. We're seeing a phenotypic correction of the marrow and peripheral blood and stabilization for the most part of the bone marrow failure. Um, but we need to know, is that stabilization going to continue or in fact, are we actually gonna get full correction? And what happens to those bone marrow cells that aren't corrected? And we're now opening a, um, a second trial and I'll just say that it's very similar to the prior one, um, except we're liberalizing a little, or changing a little bit of the inclusion criteria. The other thing is we're only gonna use fresh cells. We're not gonna cryopreserve um, the cells before giving them to the patient after they've been transduced. And this trial is about to open in our center in about a month. Um, and I don't have time to go through this, but the other work that's being done is instead of using lentivirus is to use CRISPR technology, which is a little more precise, but even more exciting, Mark Osborne at our institution is looking at single base um, editing, which will allow us instead of targeting a huge portion of the of the genome is really just correcting the base that needs to be corrected. And he's shown on the right hand side in um, FA lymphocytes that he's been able to achieve this. And that would be very exciting because you don't have all the other complications of correcting a larger part of the gene than you need to. And the other area that's being worked on is looking at antibodies that perhaps could be given prior to the corrected cells to help with engraftment. So both anti-CD45 have been tested, but really most effort is going to anti-CD117. So you could give that antibody to patients and then give them the corrected cells and that antibody would help create more space in their marrow, get rid of their own stem cells. So I think there's a lot of exciting things that we've done in cellular therapy for FA patients. And I think it's very exciting to see where gene therapy is gonna fit for these patients. And finally, just wanna end with a thank you to, and an acknowledgement to all the people in my program that helped to make this work possible and funding. Thank you. We have time for one question, burning a question. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. 
I can repeat it if I, yeah. Yeah. So FA patients with leukemia are extraordinarily challenging. Um, the first thing I always check is to make sure they don't have biallelic BRCA2. Um, so BRCA2 is a subset of FA patients that present with de novo leukemia versus a classic FA patient that develops MDS and then leukemia. Um, the, the major question with these patients is, do, uh, do you give them chemotherapy before transplant? Um, what chemotherapy do you give and then how do you transplant them? The challenge with giving them leukemia is it's very hard to give effective therapy without um, too much toxicity. And basically, the most therapy will just push them into aplasia. Um, our approach is if they're stable and their blast count isn't too high, we just go directly to transplant. Um, if, they're ha if they have very aggressive acute leukemia, um, you can give mini-flag or other agents just to get the, the burden down, but you won't get them into remission before transplant. And transplant is the only um, curative therapy. Um, in our hands, about a third of the patients will uh, get through and be alive and in remission after transplant, a year after transplant, but the risk of relapse is about 50%. Um, so it really speaks to FA patients upon diagnosis need to be followed annually with the marrow at least. If they have a colonial abnormality, I do it more often um, so that they indeed don't develop leukemia because it's a game changer once they develop leukemia. Um, and certainly, again, to make sure they don't have BRCA2 because that's a whole other issue of how to manage those patients. Thank you, Dr. McMillan.